Good morning. Here we are on the fourth Sunday of Lent. I cannot believe we're getting so close to Easter Sunday. I can barely contain myself. And yet we're in the season of Lent where we're supposed to be calm, collected. We're supposed to be getting ourselves together. We're supposed to be preparing ourselves. It's a season where we're reminded of our own deaths, our own sinful natures. But I can't help myself to be ready. I can't wait till Easter Sunday, one of my greatest Sundays that I love more than anything in the entire church calendar, the day that Jesus really did do what he said he was going to do, redeeming the world 100%. I hope you'll do whatever it takes to be here on that Sunday. Bring a friend, bring a neighbor, bring someone along that has always felt like an outsider and make them an insider, bringing them to this place where they will hear the gospel message, and they will be invited into a relationship with King Jesus, the one who knows them and loves them. All that started way back when, as we look at our passages at hand today with this Old Testament passage and the New Testament, the Psalm, the gospel, they're all fantastic, but it all started in the Old Testament. As we read today, and the passage we read today reminds us of the story of redemption once again, doesn't it? The story that began in Genesis 1 when God the Father, who was in perfect harmony with God the Son and God the Spirit, simply said, let's create. Let's make something out of nothing. And through the spoken word of God, the story began with sin entering the world. Didn't happen right away. At first, he did some creating. He did some wonderful creating. Out of absolute nothing in time and space, he created the earth. And then he said, let's put some stars up here in the sky. And let's put some dry land over here. And let's divide the dry land and throw an ocean in. And let's put some creatures for the ocean, the fish of the sea and the whales and the shark. And let's put some birds up in the sky. And then let me create my most excellent thing. Let me create human beings who I can have a relationship with, that I can love and spend time with and give them a perfect place to live and ask them to simply obey one simple rule. Just don't eat of that tree over there. And as we all know, through the spoken word of God, the story began to spin out of control. In creation of Adam and Eve, the story of one-way love began. And as we all know, soon into the story, Adam and Eve messed up brilliantly. (laughs) The best ever. As I said just a second ago, they had one simple rule. Don't eat from that tree. And they didn't have it within themselves not to. You know, many times we think that sin entered because they took a bite of an apple. Or because... They gave in to what a snake said to them. No, the real sin under the whole thing was the fact that they bought into the lie that God didn't really love them, that he didn't really know what's best for them, that he was holding back from them and not giving them what they deserved, that they had the opportunity of becoming equal with God and he was holding that back. And they bought into that silly little lie and they bit into that apple and at the moment they did, Sin entered their veins. Sin entered the world. Well, the story continued through the population of the world, but it was still broken and sinful. So God decided, after many attempts of starts and finish, stop, starts and stops, starts and stops, to level the playing field, to destroy the world, leaving only Noah and his family along with one couple of every animal kind. But as we know, not even Noah had within himself the ability to be good or to keep the rules. And soon we see sin running through their veins, through the veins of man. And throughout the Old Testament, we see this up and down story of redemption as man sins. And God provides forgiveness through death and redemption takes place. And that brings us to where we are today. (coughs) Excuse me. (coughs) Excuse me. As I mentioned earlier, we're doing some construction around here and the dust is causing me to seize. I apologize. Forgive me. Anyway, back to where we were. 
God gave forgiveness and restored over and over and over again. And finally, we get to where we are today. Today we see Samuel standing before Jesse, looking to anoint the one who would carry the line of Jesus. Now think about that. Samuel was told to go, anoint someone other than Saul to be king, and he rightfully feared for his life in doing so. But God said, stop mourning and go to Jesse's house and invite him to sacrifice with you, and there I will show you what you are to do. Talk about blind faith. Talk about stepping into the unknown. Talk about not knowing what you're going to do or who you're going to anoint. And so surely he went to what was normal. He went to what society judged as good. He thought, this will be simple. I'll go to Jesse's house. I'll find his oldest son. Anoint him as king. We'll move about our business. I'll get out of Dodge so that nothing happens to my life. And yet he arrives, and the first son comes before him. And the scripture says he was strong, strapping, and tall, had it all together, was the oldest of sons. And just before the oil is poured over his head, God said, stop! He's not the one. And the scripture says that they go through every single son, all the way to the last one that's sitting in the room with them. And finally, Jesse says, don't you have any other children? Don't you have some other boys? Are there anybody else? I mean, are we missing something? And just at that point, he says, well, I do have my youngest son, but he's out in the field tending the animals. And he sends for him. And he gets the youngest, young David. And the story of redemption does not work that way. You see, God wanted to make a statement that day that it was not the oldest or the smartest or the best looking or the wealthiest or the one that was deserving. In fact, it would be the lowest of the low, the son who was not even called up. It would be the weakest of them all. He was a boy. It would be the poorest of them all. As number eight, the shares of the inheritance would not have paid him a living wage. And on his own, he most likely would have continued to work for the family as a shepherd. But in God's economy, he was perfect for the job. He was the right call. He was ruddy and handsome in his own way. In fact, he would be the perfect picture of Jesus. And that day, David's life changed forever. Scripture says he was anointed with oil in the presence of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. And at this point, the Scripture begins to take David's life, and we get to see the high moments and the low moments as it tracks all of David's life through the good times and the bad times, through when he thought, was God even there and was he not there? You see, when I read the story of David, I'm reminded that yes, I'm a sinner who is in Christ and I'm a mess up every day, but praise God, when Jesus died on the cross, all of my sins were forgiven, past, present, and future. And because of that, I am redeemed and I am clean before God. You see, the story of redemption continues today to those of us who are called by his name. You look at David's life, he had nothing that said, you're going to be the next king. And yet he was a guy chosen after God's own heart. And yet you look at the ebb and flows of his life and the great things that happened to him when he, God rescued him and saved him from being killed. And then his life gets thrown upside down. And then he sends his country to war. And then he has an affair. And then he kills somebody. And he's a terrible father. And he's a murderer. And it seems like he's horrible and he's done. My friend, that's how forgiveness and reconciliation works. God always chooses those who are the furthest out, who don't have their stuff together, to do great things for him. My friend, if you've never become part of the story of redemption, you're invited to do so. 
He's not looking for us to get ourselves together and to shine ourselves up. He's not looking for the most strapping. He's not looking for the most successful business person in the room. He's looking for fellow sinners who need redemption, who need forgiveness, who need to be loved. And when David completely threw it all away and messed up royally, can you imagine how he must have felt? Not only letting his family down, not only giving his older siblings the privilege of saying, see, I told you so, you're a train wreck, you had no business being the king, but he let God down. And in those moments of desperation and depression and fear and wondering what's next, we get this wonderful book. They're actually letters called the Psalms of David. And we get to see a man fully throwing himself back to God, declaring how woefully gone his heart is, declaring boldly that he's a big fat mess up, declaring that he is nothing and God is everything. And we see this redemptive thing happening as God restores him and puts him back into proper place and makes him the man that he wants him to be. Why? Because God is constantly taking our lives and molding us and taking us to where he wants us to be. And just like David, God wants to take you, whatever it is that you have right now, whatever it is you're going through, whatever it is that makes you feel like you're far from him, he wants to take it. He wants to mold it. and He wants to put it back together. You know, one day when he comes again, and he's coming, he's going to return. Easter doesn't end with Easter. Easter reminds us that he's going to come back to raise our dead carcasses back to new life, to restore us to the former glories, to make all sad things come untrue, to restore the land and the ground and the earth back to what it was, and to give us a heavenly home there where life is perfect again, just like it was in the garden. And you're invited to be a part of that. And so I invite you, cry out to God. Read that psalm that we just read a moment ago and make it the meditation of your heart. And follow Jesus through the rest of this Lenten season. And know that you're loved, and you're forgiven, and God declares you in. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.